I'm happy to see you all again. And um, just a few things um, ahead. Um, the, the lecture by Johannes Wagemann from last time, there has been some technical problems. You are aware of that. And um, we changed that. He, he did a new recording and put it into the, in, in, into the internet now. And you can download it if you like. But I think some parts of the discussion are still uh, available in it. No? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So there will be, the, um, Katarina did the cutting <laughs> and put yes. together the old version with the new version. So now we have it um, online. And um, I just want to say it's a, it's a very special situation we have in, in Germany now, um, again, around, around Corona. I don't know how it is in other parts of the world, but there is a real world of bashing because um, the, 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 the journals and the media, they, they have the opinion and they think they detected that the, the, the main people who are against vaccination are coming from anthroposophy and Waldorf and that so there is a wall of bashing we have never had before. Yesterday there was an article in Der Spiegel, a very famous uh, uh, German journal, and it said Steiner sect. So this is what the situation is now in comparison to Scientology and stuff like that. And everything is mentioned, uh, the medicine, the agriculture, the, the world of pedagogy, everything as a problem. So this is the situation right now. Uh, fortunately, I got um, uh, um, an email today by another famous uh, uh, German journal, uh, Zeit Online, and they asked me for an interview and I did it today and I really hope I could correct a bit of this situation. Um, because you know, we really know Steiner wasn't against vaccination, as it said. He was very pragmatic in stuff like that, very clear and pragmatic. And I really said it's not the ide ideology of Waldorf or theory of Waldorf, which is the problem. It's maybe there's some kind of a sociological situation and individualism and stuff like that. But this is part of our society, as we see, and you can't um, take uh, Waldorf um, into account for, for a problematic situation. Yeah, but we have to face it and we see it in the media. I, th I don't know how the situation in your country all over the world is. In Germany, there is a really strong discussion ongoing and it's almost every journal who is, is, is um, uh, forming judgments like that in, in Germany right now. There has been a quite nice um, article just to know in the NZZ, so Neue Züricher Zeitung from Switzerland, um, about Rudolf Steiner as a philosopher. That has been a really great article by Philipp Kofsche. If you want to look it up, or maybe you can put it into the internet, Katharina, if you find it. Okay, just to say that, that there is a, um, yeah, some tension in the society around Waldorf right now. Nevertheless, we, we are very happy to work together on that international level. And I'm very happy to um, have Frank de Kiefde um, from the Hoge School Leiden as a, um, a speaker tonight. Um, and he's going to speak the art of didactics. So we have a really pedagogical topic um, um, today. And he is very experienced as a class teacher at Delft in Holland for a long time. And Frank has been school managers for two Waldorf schools after that, and has been educational advisor for the um, uh, Waldorf schools in the Netherlands for a long time. And since 2001, he is, is working in the teacher training, first in Zeist and um, now at the Hogeschool Leiden, where we have a cooperation, um, Alanus and Hogeschool Leiden. We are working together very closely on several levels, also on, on research. And I'm very much happy to have you here. And Frank said he is also happy if you have questions or remarks within his lecture, he can open um, the stage for that so don't hesitate to to write in the into the chat during that lecture or and frank is is open or that maybe you have a pause sometimes just to look if there is something coming if you think it's good to have a talk so it's not the talk and in the end a long conversation you we can have it in between two as frank said yeah i'm happy um to have you all here and i'm happy you can um, contribute today frank it's yours now Thank you. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to, uh, to give this uh, talk. Uh, I share my screen. The Art of Didactics, that is indeed the title of a book that I wrote two years ago about uh, didactics in uh, 
Waldorf pedagogie. Uh, this is what I uh, want to tell you uh, this evening or this morning. Um, I have always been interested in didactics. I made a study about <coughs> the process of learning and about the art of the open question. Um, I um, worked in various project groups on themes as uh, differentiation, the three stroke. Uh, I made an, a research to the art of the open question and uh, uh, methods uh, comes, uh, uh, comes there out and also the methodology. And at the end, I will uh, make a summary about how I see learning a process of social education and cultural transform. Well, the, the picture of the book, uh, that is what you see here. And I, um, I want to ask you, what do you see in this picture? And you can write it in the chat or you can tell us uh, when you uh, turn on your microphone so we can hear it. I would like to, to hear that, but I give a few moments to think about it and um, give words to what you see. Radiating light. Radiating light, that is nice. Friendship. Uh -huh. Thank you. In the chat, I read wave, circles and stralen, dynamic color spiraling, punkt und kreis, evolutionary spiral, colors, swirly sky, yeah. Look up to the sky. The urknall, the big bang, <laughs> time vortex, tunnel, Ah, thank you for all the remarks. It's uh, very uh, various what you uh, mentioned. Um, there is not one answer. Uh, all the answers are fantastic. A joy, yes, just yes, joy. Uh, um, I hope also that there is something to see of a meeting of an, 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 an uh, working together, principle of working together. Uh, what I wanted to express was um, um, the strong aspect of community in learning in a group of pupils. There are so many ways of learning and it comes all together in a process of learning together, learning from peers, from tutors in a combination of community and the individual. So that is what I wanted to express. But everyone has the right to give his own explanation. Oh, we don't go further. Oh. Yes. Um, the study of men is for me the inspiration for the education but also for the didactics. So I try to make the connection between didactics and the study of men. And um, it helps me to make choices and to find the methods for the learning process. Didactics means for me also creativity and fantasy. Uh, to get to know your group, your pupils, and to know what they need. And that, that is, uh, that is a, a way to find out uh, what, what, what they need. That is a process, also a process. Well, as I said, uh, the study of, uh, I made a study about the process of learning. Uh, before we get to talk about the didactics, it's important to know what, 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 what is learning, what, what are the aspects of learning? And I looked into the work of Steiner and other pedagogues, and I looked for um, items 
belonging to learning. So a child lives in his senses, open to the world, out of his interest. And from the inside comes the power to make the impression from their selves. And during the development, the inner activity grows. The role of the thinking processes increases. And what I also important uh, find is the, the main aim in Waldorf pedagogy that the children can form their own concepts and that the concepts can grow and that they don't get contexts which are fast, it stands, so is it for the whole life. No, it is a movement. Um, here we see the seven life processes. Steiner described these uh, processes of living, seven ways. And uh, it starts with breathing. And uh, breathing is the first connection with the world. And it starts very quick after birth, the process of breathing. And um, it's a very important also for the process of warming with breathing. You get also warming. And uh, in the process of warning, you get a relation between your own temperature and temperature of the world outside. Now the central processes are nutrition and circulation. And this is the transformation from substances, Stoffwechsel. The substances become part of our body. And maintenance and growth are the steps to consolidate the body. And reproduction is a higher level than growth, the formation of a new embryo. Then can we also make the connection from the senses and the seven life processes? Uh, Steiner describes the observation through the 12 senses. We get impressions from color, sounds, smell, taste, which can remain in the soul. And that is an activity from the eye. I mean, an ego, I, and not our I, but I, I myself. Um, interaction with the world. Um, there's an activity from the I, interaction with the world. In the ego arises the unity of the different sense perceptions. It's all come together, and there's an activity of the I. The life processes can give a feeling of well being comfort. The impressions through the senses are remaining as an activity of the eye. The experience which comes from the life processes arises without intervention of the eye. Uh, life lives in all the senses. It goes through the sense areas. The activity of the breath works in all the sense areas, the smell, the sight, the sound, can work if that which receives the life of the breath is for the benefit of all the senses. Now, we go from the steps of living to the steps of learning. Uh, Van Houten relates the breathe. Uh, sorry, Van Houten uh, and Linnenau have made the connection between the life processes and the process of learning. Van Houten described the learning process from an adult. And Linnenau related the life process and the process of thinking. And um, Annemieke Zwart uh, did um, the same, the connection with the learning process for the process in the, in the school and also in the elementary school. Well, 
here there stands uh, as this other living and learning. Um, Van Houten relates to breathing and the observation. Observe, you you look at the, at, at the appearances in the, in the world and in the environment, and the learning process starts with 12 senses. The world comes right. And the breathing goes through all the seven steps. Inhale leads to internalizing, and through exhale we give it back to the world. And in the process of warming, we get a connection with the theme, with what we are learning. I connect me as a person which what I want to learn. That is an activity of the I. In the transition to the nutrition and the processing is according to Van Houten, a main thing that we don't accept a content which we don't understand. So here we like to feel the activity of the autonomy. We make it ourselves. The translation to the circulation and the individualization needs to be a quiet inner space. So something new can get a place there. That could be a breakthrough. These are the words of Van Houten about this uh, process. And what he also said is the new insights can be consolidated in the process of maintenance. and exercise. Without the consolidation, the new knowledge or skills evaporate or even disappear. And then, so um, describes Van Houten, the skills increase in the unconsciousness area where they can grow. And, in the, and then after a long period, they, they become skills. And in the learning process, we need to exercise, to repeat in various ways. Uh, sometimes I found something, how it works at the computer, and then I know how, it, how I, I can find it, and I don't exercise it, and then after a long period, I come it again, and then I have to re-invent it, invent it, because I don't have exercised it. So the importance of exercise is to to get it in your habit. Uh, the combination of reproduction and create make clear that the seventh step could be a repetition or a birth of something new. And Van Houten compares it with artwork in which the artist has changed himself. The artwork has created the artist. Well, we can de use these steps in lessons, in developing knowledge and skills. Then we have them also in the lemniscate. And um, when we look at this uh, picture and we see the seven steps, then we can see that we start in the heart with the observation and um, the observation uh, can give the, the feeling this belongs to me, this shoots me, so we can connect ourselves and then we are here to the connection, verbinding. Then comes the stage of processing that leads to the transformation to individualize, that goes through the heart. Again, through the heart. The step of exercise comes after we have made the transformation of processing and individualizing, uh, exercising at the beginning, then we learn tricks. We learn how to do it as we are told. But when we have the opportunity to make it ourselves, then after that we can exercise. And then we can exercise what we have learned 
our own strategy, our own way of doing this. And then we have to get the step of the create, and it's that we can make it in a in an artificial form, in a song or a poem or a picture or a story that we write, and a creation from what we have learned in a special form. Oh. Yeah, he goes further. Uh, the seven steps of learning means for me an opportunity to get differentiation. So we can work with all the different uh, levels in a group. And I have made questions for every step in the process of learning. What have you observed? And when we start a process and we introduce a theme and the context, the, the, the whole area where we in, as in, um, investigate, and then we can say, what have you observed? What is the meaning for you? What impresses you? That is the connection. What can you do with it? So we work with it. That is the process of transformation. How did you work with it? Can we ask, when do we have did work? Uh, individualize which solution fits you. What is your uh, way of, of natural um, way of doing this? Exercise, what is your way to learn it by heart? Um, expand, what do you experience when you use another strategy or another context? And create, what for form do you want to use? So these questions can be helpful when you are in the process and when you look back at it for yourself. Uh, I wait a moment. Uh, is this uh, to follow for everyone? Is it too fast or too slow? It's fine. Ah, thank you. Then we go further with a uh, next theme. Uh, these are the methods. Um, it comes forth out of the investigation uh, in the process of learning. And then we have uh, the model of the three stroke. And that is a model for lessons for periods. Um, the three stroke is the, the short form of the seven steps of learning. It is a, a summary of the seven steps. And we start with one in the area of concrete action, movements, play, uh, uh, exploration, and we are doing things. We don't talk about it, we do it. I give an example after I have uh, discussed the model. Um, in the second level, the children make drawings and pictures from, from what they have done, and that is, to see, and this is what we have done. We don't, we, we can see it, cannot see it. But when we have, when we, when we make drawings, schemes, models, then we can see what we have done. And then it comes in the soul. We can look at it. The, in the uh, level of drawings, there can grow a model or a scheme. And the children work with the model a few days and it it grows, it, it changes. And uh, then, then there comes a moment that the children don't need the model anymore. They learn it by heart. And then they come in step three, the mental action, internalizing, learning by heart, memorizing, memorization, memorization. Uh, that is when you don't have to think about it, you know it. Uh, Luke Alting, one of our uh, old teachers, says always, het is uit je hoofd, as it's out of your head. 
you don't have to think about it, you know it. Uh, for example, uh, we walk in classroom and we count together through the classroom and we're going, um, uh, counting uh, further and further till we get 100. And we do, we do that every day and we, we walk and we count and it's together and with, with all the pupils. And um, after that, they make drawings from what we have done. And these drawings grow to a model of the number line. And you can see often in classrooms, number lines hanging in front of the classroom so, that, so the children can use that when they make their operations. And the number line has to disappear so the children come to internalizing. So they can use it a few weeks and then we get it back, uh, we, we take it away so they learn it also inside. Now, the three stroke is also a, a, sehr, a very helpful uh, instrument for the differentiation. Uh, pupils can, longer, can work longer in the area of concrete action. So when they need more movement, uh, repeated movement, so th that is possible. And when children uh, a longer time uh, needs to work with the model, is it also possible? Um, and for the children who are started at the mental level, they go the reverse way. They go, they go first to the uh, second level. They make um, uh, pictures, they uh, look for models, they look examples in the world. Uh, where do we see our uh, numbers, for example? So they, get, uh, they go first to the second level and then we can ask to make a play or to make movements uh, to get it on the ground on the first step. Well, here we see an example of the of a model uh, from the uh, uh, divide an amount into our raisins, and uh, children the di divided in groups uh, uh, raisins, and they discovered a strategy. When we asked ten, and then ten, and then it goes not ten, then we take in this case four. So they learned the strategy from uh, taking off 10. And uh, there, under uh, there, they, they, you see the number line, which can hang in the classroom. I said already the, the seven, uh, the, the three stroke is the, the, the seven steps in, in a small, um, in a short summary, uh, we see observe and connect, that is concrete, the model level, then we have process and individualize. And in a mental area, we have exercise, expand and create. So the three stroke is, is a very handy model and we can use it for a lesson and also for a period, but the, the form with the seven steps is expanded, um, more possibilities. But when teachers begin, then the three stroke is, is, uh, is good to do in, in practice. Well, my... Uh, Investigation was also about the art of the open question. Um, uh, I, uh, I made a research in literature and in practice, how teachers think about and work with the open question. And I gave my results the name, the art of the open question, because I think it is an art to find the right question. 
I have collected the advantages of the open question. Um, you see here a few open questions give more answers. It brings movement in the way of thinking. It invites pupils to discuss and consider. It stimulates creative thinking. It gives information about what pupils know from the subject. And sometimes it's very surprising what the children answer. And I investigated also the closed question because sometimes it is, uh, it, it, it is helpful to check of the children have understood it in the right way. So that is the use of the closed question. Well, I have um, collected examples from open questions. Uh, some of them are examples of open assignments, not an open question, but an open assignment. Um, and there is also a question about the foreknowledge of the children, what they already know. So the last one, what do you know about Egypt? Create your own supermarket is so a sort of open assignment. How many newspapers also? And um, for me, is this an art to, to get a, a, an open question, which is the start of a period of a theme of a longer process, the start of a process of finding strategies and making one strategy of your own, which also leads to um, an, a, a model and, and uh, uh, drawings and pictures and a scheme. Uh, Steiner spoke about uh, open questions and, uh, and about questioning in his lectures and in the conferences with the Waldorf teachers. He spoke about asking questions while you know the answer. And he says, in fact, that is a lie when you ask something what you already knows. And I believe we get a strange conversation when we ask and children give answers who not correspondent with what we have in mind. So the children get the feeling that they are guessing what the, children, what the teacher has in mind. And I think a question is a real question is when you don't know the answer, when it is a question for you also. Uh, now, Steiner um, talked about the import importance of the interest in what the other has to say. So we ask to get more information and to make the connection with the pupils. For the teacher, it seems to me important to mobilize, mobilize the foreknowledge of the pupils, what they already know, and also what they think about it. And that is also the next quote about curiosity. He, he asks the pupils, what do you think? What do you think? He wants to know that. And also the curiosity about making a, an assignment before we can ask, what do you want to know? And after that, what do we have discovered? Then another aspect from the methodology. Um, in the practical course for teachers, Erziehungskunst, there are many, many, many notes about methods and methodology. And I have uh, taken a few because I thought um, this shoots to the other uh, items, but there, there are so many um, remarks on how we can um, educate, how, how we can create our education. Well, the first one, uh, first writing and then reading. It's a very known principle, but when we see in practice, we can, we can ask, uh, are we doing this? 
or are we forgotten this? Uh, we can tell a story, we make drawings about it, uh, we writing about it, uh, uh, letters, words, sentence, a short story, and we are reading that. An effect is that willing, feeling, and thinking. When we got the whole process, then we can see that this a sort of example for, for other processes while we uh, via, uh, uh, when we, uh, f f uh, with a story, with a sound, and that becomes a picture, and this comes inside, um, we make it ourselves. Then we have analysis and synthesis that has to do with uh, language and mathematics, but also with other subjects. Analysis from the whole to the parts, and from the parts to the whole synthesis. synthesis. Uh, in the language, we take the whole world, word, and we divide it into separate sounds. We can walk these parts. We start with the whole word, we walk in steps the separate sounds, and walk back to the whole word. And in mathematics, we can make operations like 24 is. Make operations with the answer 24. So it gives a number uh, to possibilities. In the language, we can ask to make words with the letters of the word locomotive. And make words with the letters from that word. So also, differentiation, they can make as much as they want. Steiner uh, talked about um, a rule which is discovered, and then we can ask the pupils to find examples. And he compares that with playing outside. I have a quote, I shall, uh, shall let, uh, let, him see, uh, let him see him. This is the quote about drawing, writing, and reading the whole process. And then the, the writing outside, the, the, the drawing and the reading of the handwriting and then the reading in a book. And then analyze and, analyze and synthesis. There he mentioned that. Uh, um, Frank, just one remark. I can't read uh, so fast. So you, you switch too fast with that. Uh, I think it's for others the same. I, I shall give uh, some uh, time to, uh, to read it. Yeah. Have you read it? Yes, yes. Thanks. Then, ana analyze and synthesis. Uh, what I want to say, to say is the, the, the natural habit of analyze versus what comes from the outside world demands a synthesizing activi activity. And that is in education also uh, the what we want is that they uh, that they start open and that they and at the end oh, know what the answer is and that they can learn it by heart. But that there some time is for the exploration to all the possible answers, and that is an opposite, and we have to deal with that. I think.
And I think that the aspect of freedom also important. It gives space, it gives freedom to, uh, to find from whole to the parts what possible is. Can I go further? I would have a question for that. Maybe you can answer it um, um, a bit later or you can decide when to do it. But this um, distinction between analytical activity and synthesizing activity. So to, to go a bit further into that, explain what it means, what is, what is meant by that and what does it mean for the, for the uh, development of the child that would be quite interesting for me to discuss, but we can do it afterwards also, it mustn't be now. Yes, fine, then do it after that, yes, thank you. Looking for examples, um, I, I, I was surprised um, uh, to read uh, about what, what uh, Steiner said, uh, uh, they like doing this now as much as used to like romping out of doors, so we let the children find examples and it is like as if they are playing outside, as if they are make movements, but it is an inner process, but well, that they like it and that they do it uh, with enthusiasm and that they tell about uh, at home about it. Then my last uh, item is deductive or inductive. And it has to do with from the whole to the parts and from the parts to the whole. Deductive, we can explain a rule and we can ask the children to find examples. Inductive, we find the rule together by collecting examples and compare these and formulate together the rule. Uh, and the teacher says, we try to find the subject in the sentence. He explains it. Uh, he let them see how they can find it. And then they, they, they try to, uh, it uh, with other sentence to do so as the teacher has told. And um, for me, it's a question. What do you think? Um, it looks like the way which Steiner describes is deductive from the whole to the parts. He gives the summary of the rule and then they find out the, the examples. And how is that in Waldorf education? What is the importance of discovering the rule together or that you give the rule and they find examples? It's for me a question because the, the analysis uh, main main thing in Waldorf education, from the whole to the parts. And it seems to me that that is more deductive instead of inductive. Is the question clear? Yes, shall we go into it now? Yeah, or shall we take first your question? Um, so I, I would say something to this, what you now put, um, um, the question of deductive and inductive. I think um, the, the gesture is, is, of course, is totally different. And the epistemological implications, so how, how we relate to our knowledge and how we relate to the world is totally different. So if we um, choose the deductive way, um, we, it's like stepping into the world again, finding examples, being interested in the world and have a new look. So have a new look into the, into the world and having, um, being curious and, and, and look around um, with that perspective of having an idea and, and, and seeing and finding that idea in the world. 
The other um, uh, movement, the, the inductive um, movement, is something like stepping out of the world. It's a bit more difficult. It's, it's finding the satis satisfaction of concepts, the freedom of thinking. And I think it's a question of a soul balance. If we want the children to get involved in the world again, or if we say we want the children to follow their own paths of, of finding a rule, finding a, a, a higher concept, find, finding a general idea and stuff like that. And of course, it's the question of, so to speak, the intuitive intelligence of the children. So there might be children, for them it's quite, uh, quite easy and it's a good task to find the rule. But for others, it might be very much difficult. And so it's a question of intuitive intelli intelligence and we have to balance it within the class, not only to address the very intelligent pe uh, students, but we have to address them. And I think it's the more challenging pathway to do the inductive way. The more, um, uh, the other pathway is to give them the rule is something to get them interested in the world and, and place them in the world again. So this is, we, we address different kind of students and we, um, I think it's a different kind of um, um, yeah, soul balance we, um, we um, support by that. Yeah. Yeah. May I add something to that? Uh, if you look in the, the, the process of learning, eh? you said before, first we write and then we read, to say it short. But then what is the reading? We have a sentence on the blackboard and the children are not able to read it. And we, we give them now hints how you can find what is what you have written there. It is purely deductive. It is wonderful. You see the children see the complete image of a word and through deduction, they come to the letters that together make that word. word. But if we, if we go into math examples, uh, 65, 56, in what components you can split that, then you are in the inductive mood. Yeah. And I guess both, if the children learn to handle both, that is healthy. So I think uh, inductive or deductive, uh, de de uh, deductive and inductive depends also from which subject you are working on. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's also what you meant, eh, Frank, in this, uh, in this polarity, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Dirk, Dirk Rode, um, can you say something about your remark in the chat? The question of the age of the of the yeah. Yes, I I I I think it's also an uh, an aspect. Yes, how old are they and how 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 they, they, they take the impressions in movement, in doing things, uh, or thinking about what is my strategy, what is my natural way of doing this. So it has also to do with, uh, oh, yeah. with the words to it. Dear Grode is just saying that his uh, uh, computer doesn't work properly. So I, I give the question by Dirk, he asked if it's um, the, the question of um, the age, um, the age yeah. going the deductive or inductive way, maybe lower versus upper grades. This is his question. Now, I mean, uh, inductive and deduct uh, deductive is in his uh, subject, uh, chemistry and physics, of course, a highly interesting subject yeah. where you can do both yeah. with older children. But in literacy and, and calculations in math, in the lower school, you have this polarity or so. Yeah. It's a pity that Derek cannot uh, speak. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Joost? Yes, yes. Ah, 
Okay, now, okay, then, uh, and I also try to switch on the camera because. Now, now we under, now we hear you at okay. least. Okay, it, it, it's, I only wanted to add, uh, my, my comment is because Joost said, well, induction and deduction, you can relay this to incarnation. And uh, so to coming into the world and to get incarnated. And so I thought maybe I got the impression that uh, today uh, our speaker was, he, uh, Frank, mainly related to lower grades. So I myself, I'm a teacher for the upper grades. And I wonder maybe it's uh, on one hand, it's right for the lower grades, but on the other hand, to find rules out of examples is, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, maybe good for, for the higher grades because that's what we frequently use in teaching in uh, all sorts of different subjects in the upper grades. So I wondered well, maybe this, uh, because Frank, in the beginning you said, well, didactics relates, of course, uh, to a subject as well as, as to students, as well as to the school, the country you're in, the city you're in and so on. So as well, um, it might be also a question of the age of the students uh, you're teaching. So that, yeah, I, I only, it was only a reaction to what Joost said, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, okay. Shall we then take the question of, from Joost about the analysis and the synthesis? Can you repeat your question, Joost? Yes, you know, I, I see that quotation, quotation by Steiner for the very first time, or maybe it's the very first time I'm, I think about it. So what he says that the analyzing activity is, has something of freeing the human mind. There's freedom connected to that. And so what is exactly meant by analyzing activity in relation to, to, to school and teaching work and uh, during the learning process? And so and maybe you can give some examples for that. What, what, what does it mean analyzing and synthesizing? So if it's synthesizing, if I take mathematics and say um, three plus four equals seven, is that the synthesizing activity or is it the analyzing activity to say seven equals and then we have to go into the analytical part of um, a mathematical process or um, just I can't see it right now what's meant by that. Yeah, well what you say is, is right, uh, this synthesizes is when uh, back to the whole, uh, the parts and then to the whole. Three. So that would be mean it's a, the same like deductive and inductive. It's the same meant by that. I, I, I'm looking for the relation. Okay. It, it, you need both. It is not only analyzed. You have to also know what the answer, what the answer is. In the end, you have to know what is for uh, three, uh, four, uh, four. You know what... what what, what my, my, my aspect is concerning the question of induction and deduction, as I said, stepping into the world, uh, incarnation, I'm not so, so much happy with that um, interpretation, Dirk. I would just say going into the world of perceptions. So I, I would inter have interpretation more on the level of epistemology, not, not going into the body. It can be meant, but I wouldn't go so far right now. So deduction would um, 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 go into the world of per perceptions. Um, induction would mean going into the world of concepts. And we, we in every um, knowledge process, we con connect concepts and percep perceptions. Analyzes and synthesis, I would just more say it's within the world of concepts. So I have a concept and then I, the, the analytical um, um, 
capacity, which means what is con what is um, what are the parts of that concept? I have an organism and ask what belongs to that organism, for example, how it is composed, so to speak. Um, so I, but this is this is a mental process within the within an intellectual sphere, not so much connected to the world of perceptions. This is my question: Is it that? Um, may I make a step back, Joost? Sure, sure. I, I'm happy to. Yeah, to because get if you look at this quote uh, from the Erneuerung der Pädagogischen Didaktischen Kunst, I understand this quote in this way that Steiner describes that uh, the analytical, analytical soul activity is a kind of. Uh, unconscious normal state of modern human beings. We are all unconsciously uh, uh, analytical and that's part of our freedom. That's the first part of that quote. And the second part is that he then said, but it is precisely this analytical activity that we usually take far too little into account in teaching and education. And that is very interesting, this, uh, this uh, opposition. So the normally state of mind in modern society, in an unconscious way, is uh, the analytical uh, mode. And we use that not enough in education. That is he saying here. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Do you have an idea about that, Frank? There is something by Job Eichenbaum. I, I think it's quite quite interesting interesting in the chat. Can you put oh, yeah, it okay. yourself, Job? <laughs> Sorry. Can you just <clears throat> say it yourself? Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was thinking of writing and reading, and uh, well, they're both they're two opposite uh, uh, activities, of course. But when I write a word. I have this word, this is sound, and I need to analyze the words, the sounds in the word in order to write them down. And that is the an, uh, analytic uh, quality, and which I think that is uh, the force of antipathy. There's this force of analyzing is antipathy. But when I, uh, when I um, let's say, when I, when I read a word, I do the same. I have to analyze the word into, uh, into, the, into the letter and letters and connect them with sounds. And when I have that done that, after that, I have to synthesize it to, to, to come to the word that I've read. So, and then this synthesizing activity, the synthesis, that is more the, the quality of the sympathy. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think that's also very true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very cool. I was typing it, but, I, <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I will stop typing it down, right? <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's very nice. So, but I think in, in uh, you're better in math than I am, uh, Frank. So, <laughs> go back to go back to the mathematics. <laughs> I think it is, it is clear that in mathematics there are lots of possibilities to uh, to not um, uh, work with what comes um, what what comes next, but I have a whole and there is something changed in the world. And what has changed? What, what has come uh, in, in, in the... I kind of I could have explained it in English. Uh, what I will say is you have um, iets that veranderd is, waardoor je van het geheel kunt werken. You kunt zeggen, what is er bijgekomen? And niet, ik heb iets en er komt wat bij en dat groeit op die manier. Hmm. So he said, there, there, something uh, has changed and you have added something or it has changed and added something by itself. And that is his question, what, what that could be. Thank you. That is what I'm... Yeah. Uh, Derek, can you, can you give an example of uh, uh, analysis, analysis and synthesis in the chemistry in class 9 and 10? If you are still there, where is your computer again broken? Frank, I would ask you if 
Would it be possible to end the uh, screen sharing, maybe? Yeah, that's uh, thank you. Then I let noch the, let the last sheet, what I said I, at the beginning, learning as a process of social education and cultural transfer. So the working together, learning together in a process with all the different levels. And that during this process, they get to know what other things about a subject, what, what the meanings are, what how different you can look at it um, by individuals and by the teachers. So it is also a process you're getting to know yourself. What are your strategies? What are your what is your natural way of, of, of doing it? So for me is that sort of uh, together from com, uh, com, com, community and individual that can be together in the process. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, stop share. Okay. So, um, so far with your presentation, Frank. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, as we see it, it's very much inspiring to go a bit deeper into the process of teaching and learning. And maybe there are many more questions and discussions around that. Maybe I start with one remark. It's, it's, it's related to what we have said before the induction and deduction process. I think the interesting thing um, with Waldorf pedagogy is the evaluation of intelligence. You know, we, we are in a school system and in a, in a um, educational system where the abstract intelligence is just the thing we try to learn and everything is built upon it. But there is almost no evaluation around it. It's not questioned anymore. If we have a good abstract intelligence, people, are, students are good learners, are fast learners, they get good grades and so on, and they make a career in the society. That is the belief of our educational system. And Steiner is evaluating it and saying, yes, there is that capacity of a strong intelligence. And this is a liberating, that's the, the, the aspect of it, it's, it's a liberation experience. So by developing our own intelligence, we, we have a freedom and liberation experience, which is very much important. And on the other end, and this is the interesting point I see only within Waldorf um, um, perspectives. And on the other hand, we have the problem of getting detached from the world, stepping out of the world, being detached from, from our connection to the world. So we pay a price, so to speak. And we see in our society nowadays, in our, so to speak, intelligent society, that we really pay that price on an ecological level, on a social level. And we are totally detached. We, we are detached from the cosmic sphere and so on. This is what, what the hat system um, produces. It, it makes us free, but so to speak, lonesome. And um, so there is some kind of a counter movement Steiner tries not to exclude ex ex intelligence, of course. This is often what uh, Wolof is blamed. They don't value intelligence enough. And we have to be very careful that we, we, we um, also support the intelligent student that can't be vice versa. You know, in, in, the, in the regular school system, we, we address the intelligence students. And in, in, the Waldorf, in the Waldorf movement, we say, oh, no, don't read so much. Don't, <laughs> it's, it's too much. And it's too much a head kind, a head, a head, um, head um, a child or so, or it's too heady or something like that. So we're blaming intelligence. This can't happen. Of course, a child brings into the world what it can. But on the other hand, what I, I think, and this is what I'm really inspired by your lecture, Frank, is what Steiner says, we have to go both ways. We have to, 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 to go that, that way of liberation, but we have to, to get connected to the earth. We have to be connected to the world. We have to help the children that they can move in between and not one-sided into an, an hermetic intelligence sphere and have lost all the connection to the world. And this is something which goes from the head to the limb system, so to speak, speak in, in a metaphor. And I, I wonder, 
if this idea of deduction and um, um, induction of analysis and synthesis is something which is connected this question of going much more going to the head system or going to the limb system within so to speak an epistemological um, perspective yeah so far some remarks to that maybe others can relate to it yeah you 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 get uh, you get the idea that uh, how Frank described that, that uh, the Waldorf method is really multi-methodical. Huh? In, 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 every, in every aspect you can find polarities you can use or, and that is, that is so fascinating. Huh? So multi-methodical. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And that these were good examples you gave. Shouldn't you better say you should use all instead of we can use all so that you don't one-sided in your approach towards, uh, <clears throat> towards the, uh, what you're teaching? I, I still think, and uh, Frank described that also, mm -hmm. that uh, every subject offers his methods. Mm -hmm. If you understand the subject well, as you said before, with, with, with reading and writing, if you understand that process well, then then the process itself offers already his uh, method, his method possibilities. Yeah. Frank, you agree with that idea, right? Yes, sure. Yes, yeah. we, we should use both ways because there are so many children. Uh, on various levels, so what uh, uh, one one needs, and other needs the other way, and it yeah. can exist yeah. to identity community. So we have all our way. What is what is what what do we need? Yeah, yeah. Uh, may I have one uh, detailed question? Mm -hmm. That I know uh, when you were with this seven life processes, huh? then you compared nutrition with processing. Yes. And then you give a quote of uh, uh, Mr. Van Houten who wrote that book. Yes. S uh, you quote him when he said, a child cannot learn what it doesn't understand. Did you say that? Well, Van Houten talks about the learning process of an adult. Okay, 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 okay. And oh, that's a big difference. That's a right? big, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I don't like that children learn tricks in mathematics. So it is important that they know what they are doing. But sometimes you have knowledge which you not can understand the whole thing and that grows at a deep learning and you get more and more um, the, the, the insight uh, of the theme. There's a, a difference in knowledge and in skills. Um, may I stay a little bit to this question? And I'm also, uh, uh, if, if we make a multiplication, yeah. not with my uh, pocket calculator, but on a piece of paper with a pencil, eh? yeah, 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 317 times 18, mm -hmm. then that is a trick. Which I, have, I do not know what I do but I'm able to find a solution. Yes, what I mean is the, is the beginning, when we make simple multiplications, yeah. we can separate the numbers and we can make it clear what we are doing. But with the, the, the big operations, it's, it's not possible. Then we use other uh, instruments. Yeah. But in the beginning, it is important, I think, that children know I, there are also more strategies. I choose a strategy which helps me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that I understand. Yeah, there is a, a, a great movement also in, I see in education, use one strategy that is the straight way to the answer and then we get no uh, misunderstandings. And I disagree. I think children have to uh, discover what is their strategy? What, what suits you? 
and when you um, explain the strategy, so from do it like this, yeah, they they don't understand that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, I understand it. Yeah. But in the end, through exercise, it becomes a habit. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you have a strategy and use it, then it's fine that you 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 can uh, take that in a short way, uh, not a long process of reinvention. Yeah. Sakunan, you have uh, something to share with us. Yeah. Do you want me to say it out on my own? Or? Yes, please. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, hi there. Uh, thanks for the lovely presentation. Yeah. Now, this, because um, I, I really am moved by the whatever you're talking about and how Waldorf education is gonna is making an impact and how it's different. But then whenever we start talking about um, or oh, lower school, higher school is different. And then uh, when you talk about adults, it's different from teaching children. Aren't we moving away from what Steiner is saying? I, I've not read him very widely, but isn't doesn't he believe like in the equality of everyone reaching the cosmic, uh, and also everyone is as intelligent? Does does he say that? Does he say that, or is it is it right for us to differentiate by age? And uh, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, is it? I don't know uh, what Steiner uh, says about that, but for me, I think we are uh, equal in that sense that we have all our own intelligence. And I use then the the, the multi uh, multiple intelligence. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And so uh, you can have a musical intelligence or a mathematical or more. Uh, linguistic intelligence, so uh, nature, um, interpersonal, uh, uh, yeah. so uh, everyone has his own intelligence, and that is also the power from everyone. So, so does didactics, didactics need to change for the ages? Because when you talk about didactics, do we need to differentiate it amongst the ages, like lower school, higher school, adult and children, or can we just approach it in a in a walled off mindset as a whole. Yeah, sure. And also with the ages, yes. Uh, okay. Young children has an, another intelligence than older children, younger children do it, doing, uh, doing it. Uh, access, uh, exploration, explore it. And uh, the, the, the thinking process increases during the ages. All right, thank you, thank you. Got it. Welcome. Are there further remarks or questions? Because um, I'm so much um, touched by that topic, um, maybe I can add something, just throw it into the round as a point to discuss. Um, I think the question of intelligence and morality is something um, which is has to be um, covered together and has to be addressed together. Because a highly abstract intelligence, I, I, I put it very carefully, a highly abstract intelligence has a danger of not of, of leaving the moral ground, so to speak. Just to give an example, if you go into the finance market, market you have that dealing with abstract intelligence. Um, so we do something which has almost no relation to, to reality anymore. If there is a um, a company and it fires maybe thousands of its co-workers, um, the chairs will go up and um, people um, um, at the stock market are very much happy if they fire all the, um, the co-workers. So this is a situation we have all over the world. Yeah, if um, um, there are new regulations um, concerning ecology, which um, um, increases the costs, the chairs will go down. So, the, the, so, so this is a problem we have on a very abstract level of economy. And this is just an example that a very abstract level of intelligence loses the, uh, the relation to reality. It makes us free. So this is a money system makes us very much free, but it loses its moral ground. And 
out of my view, what, what is the main purpose of wildlife education in the world, that the children, of course, they should have this that libera liberating effect of intelligence. They should um, um, take profit out of it and have a free mind and everything. But they should, in the very same way, they should develop some sense of morality and being connected to the world and always not having abstract concepts in mind, but always relate them in a concrete way to um, the world around us and, and have a social perception and so on. So this is something which um, is bother me, bothering me very much all the time. How can we um, support the development of intelligence and in the very moment by and not being um, giving moral rules? We know that's not about Waldorf to, to teach morals, so to speak, but developing a sense of morality, which means being connected to the world, being connected to other people, have perceptions and so on. Can you see that um, that um, ideas and maybe contribute to that? Is that also the question of autonomy, individualizing and then comes to own choices where the intelligence is related to the world. I can make my choices and I know why I do that. And I speak about it with others. So autonomy, relation. Oh yeah, um, can I add something to what Josh said? Oh, yeah, I, I really, I, I can feel where he is coming from. But I, I also find that um, abstract thinking actually helps you to live with immorality, what we perceive immorality. Like, for example, you know, if you talk about Nietzsche, who is um, Nietzsche, I mean, he he's an abstract thinker, but he's able to think of the immorality of beings, from my understanding, being self-centered as a way of being moral, you know? So abstract thinking actually makes you uh, be able to empathize with immorality. That's what I think, yeah. But it's a very good um, question, yeah. Uh, I guess it's a very important uh, item, uh, Joost. Um, I think this uh, intelligence and more uh, question, intelligence and morality, again and again, are always, Steiner, in the lower school, uh, I, I would, like to hear from Dirk Rode how that's in high school. In the lower school, said, Steiner always said, what we learn, what we do in an intelligent way, it should be related with the reality of the world. And I guess that is one of the impulses for, uh, uh, I will not say for a guarantee, but for uh, a building up of a kind of a feeling of responsibility within the intellectual process, something like that. Strange enough, for those who are interested in that, Steiner said that the, 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 the moral configuration of a human being is part of his etheric forces, is part of his life forces, not from his soul forces, strange enough. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important question, the question about uh, intelligence, what is also a part of the, the formative forces and morality. Yeah, would be an interesting topic. In a pedagogical sense, <clears throat> is, in, is a teaching arts not a very important thing as a tool, I mean, to bridge between uh, the intellect, intellect and, the, and the morality. Especially, I think, in the, where you come in the, from fourth grade up, where you have these uh, subjects like science and animal world, etc. It, it, the, the tendency can be that you go in an intellectual approach there, and it needs to be in an artistic way brought to the children or to the students. Well, yeah. that's what I was thinking. The bridge between just intellect and the, the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, can I just say that? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, as a result of your lecture and the subsequent discussion just now, I've changed my mind about what I'm going to speak about in December. Um, <laughs> I was going to speak much more about the didactic aspect, but now looking at what you've talked about, um, I'm, I'm reminded of what Gerd Biester calls individuation. And I think I'm going to speak a little bit more about how we begin the path of education towards freedom with the very first lesson, with the straight line and the curve and the didactics of that. And I'll, I'll, make, I'll give a few examples in my talk in December about that. And I'm, I'm as interested in this as is everyone else here. Thank you for that. Fine, thank you. Here's a remark by Dirk Rode. Huh? Sorry, my laptop doesn't seem to enable me to take part in the discussion. I think we need to discuss the role of phenomenological teaching in this context. Um, maybe I um, can say something to that. I agree. And when I, uh, the, the, the term phenomenolo phenomenological teaching means we take um, the experiences we have sincere. So we not go into abstract concepts, but they are always related to experiences in a Goethean way. So we can say everything the child learns has to be experienced, has to be related to the world. And if that's what meant by phenomenological diac, I, I think this is really, uh, yeah, this is the base of our teaching method, the Goethean base of Waldorf education, that we take uh, the perceptions and experiences sincere and not only deal with abstract concepts. Yeah, I don't know. Do you hear me? Yes, very good. Ah, now, now I'm back again. It, it's uh, yeah. I think this gives an answer also to uh, the uh, to the relationship to the world. What you said before that uh, uh, analyzing means we uh, tend to lose the connection to the world, and uh, by a phenomenological teaching, we sort of uh, counter. Um, um, how do you say that? We count, counterbalance this that we can um, get into a closer contact with the world, that we admire or, so, or to, that at least that we value the world around us. And uh, so, yeah, and by, by this, uh, I, I think this is, uh, in a way, it's uh, also a, a way of moral teaching, even though it's, uh, I, I would also not you know, call this moral teaching, but but in a way it, relates to morality in your teaching. And what I wanted to say to Christoph uh, when he asked for, for examples from uh, science subjects, I mean, from, from uh, that uh, when, when Frank was talking about the didactics of the different uh, yeah, schools and, and countries and, and uh, subjects and so on, I think uh, for, from the subject point of view, in science subjects, it's not such a big deal be between analyzing and synthesizing because like when you teach, uh, even when you teach fire in grade seven, let's say, then the students learn at once that a fire is on one hand a destruction force and on the other hand, it creates something new. And uh, this is true for all science subjects and uh, it's always going back and forth. You analyze, things and then you see whether well, there are uh, possibilities resulting out of it. You, uh, you can create by your own thinking, you can create new things. Like when, when you teach uh, chemistry in grade 10, for example, you have a salt, then you find out that the salt uh, is, um, uh, gets out of a reaction between an acid and a base. And then you change the acids and the bases, and then you can create new salts. And so that's always, it's always like this. Or when you teach biology in grade 11, then on one hand, you take a whole organism, come down to the, all the single cells, and then you take a single cell and see how a whole organism is uh, going up out of a single cell. So I, I think maybe we, we would, if we would, deepen this, this discussion, we should have also a close look to the different subjects. I think it's probably 
quite different between the different subjects and of course of uh, relating to the different ages and so on yeah Thank you, Dirk. There, ha there have been two remarks in the chat um, um, by Rupert Löffel and after that by Daniel Woolley. Maybe, Rupert, you can give it yourself. I think it's a very interesting um, thing you, you mentioned. And I think um, Daniel is already giving some, art or, some kind of an answer to that. Um, so maybe we can hear both of you. Okay, I will try if you can, if you can hear me. Yes, very well. Um, so the the say, things that you said regarding developing intelligence and and the brain of a child on one hand and on the other hand to to keep him focused on earth and also provide him something to do with the hands and to know his body and so on that resonated well with me but on that point i was considering where would you put morality in that split is it where does it develop in which area um, so that is the first thing that came up. And I was waiting to, to ask the question until uh, you, Mr. Sheeran, um, started to elaborate further on that. And that's when I, when I started then to, to write it down. And because in my opinion, the, the intelligence does not necessarily lead to kind of a take it all approach. Because I think there are some human beings who are using all their skills and knowledge and dedication uh, on the other side of the spectrum. So while I agree that some corporations, in order to um, grab most or, or the best that they can, they will take their intelligence, dissect the laws and the, the regulations and, and just go as far as they can. Um, and that takes intelligence to do that because if you... You, you cannot cheat the system if you're not intelligent, in my opinion. But does it necessary uh, a focus on a intelligence in a person lead to that kind of amoral behavior? Or is it somewhere else that this morality has to come from? And that, and that is the thing that I'm, I don't know where to put that. Yes, thank you. Of course, I only sp spoke about the danger. There is no uh, automatic process that intelligence is immoral. That would, would I would never say that. But there is some kind of a danger connected. So um, in itself, intelligence does not lead to morality. Maybe I can say that in itself. It does not lead to morality. There has to become in something else. And as you said, put, um, put it right, it's not only being related to the earth that that's not a moral ground too there's maybe the answer is a bit in between which um, this is why i um, already mentioned um, who is it Daniel? Um, and maybe this is the right answer we have or the right focus we have to think about are you um, um daniel said he can't activate video or audio so i i read his um, comment in the chat um um, he said, I would offer that Steiner said that there is a need for humanity to learn to, and this is a quotation, think with the heart. When we bring our intelligence in service of the world through the medium of the heart that connects us with the world, then we cultivate a true moral ground between human things. So this is something else, this question of the heart. And maybe this is a totally new topic. What is meant by that? And what does it mean for a didactical process? But we have reached the end of our time, I just see. So um, you inspired us very much, Frank. And we have to leave that question open. Maybe we can address it again. And we are looking, of course, forward to your contributions, Sven. So you have a, a, some weeks ahead of you to, to give us all the answer we are looking, answers we are looking for. Um, Thank you so much, Frank, for that wonderful um, presentation and um, give us that opportunity to have a talk like that. Um, I, I wish you a good, good day, a good night, and um, looking forward to see you next Tuesday. And this is um, um, Constanza Kalix um, um, speaking to us from, from the pedagogical section of the Goetheanum. And she is talking about the human being as being in becoming. So we are really looking forward to Constanza next Tuesday.
Have a good day. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Frank. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.